Chairman Style, Ranking Member Morelli, and distinguished members of the committee, it's an honor to appear here today. Thank you for the invitation. I direct the Heritage Foundation's Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies. From June 2018 through January 2021, I served in the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs within OMB. For the last year of that period, I had a double honor to serve as administrator of OIRA and to work with uh, Satya here uh, to my right. Um, while at OIRA, I had the chance to form views about many of the ways a regulatory system succeeds and fails. The views I express here are my own and should not be construed as representing any official position of the Heritage Foundation. Today's topic, the relationship of Congress to the agencies, is a vast one. Every year, many bills are introduced to modify this relationship. Today, I would like to offer some thoughts on an overarching framework for evaluating such bills. I'd like to argue that the founders intended Congress to provide not just representation, but a certain sort of representation, one that imports into the legislative process certain qualities that Congress and Congress alone can offer. Congress should favor bills that inject these qualities into the administrative process. The Loeb Bright and relentless decisions have made it easier for Congress to play its role successfully, though ultimately that success has to come down to the actions of Congress itself. In 1788, Founding Father John Dickinson wrote that under the newly proposed American Constitution, quote, the whole people of the United States are to be trebly represented in three different modes of representation. Each branch of the new government would represent the people in its own unique way. Congress was to channel the people's wisdom and justice, the president their energy, and the courts their judgment. The Constitution brings these three modes of representation together in an arrangement that puts to use the qualities of each. The founders intended Congress to offer qualities that the president and the courts do not. Congress was meant to be the people in miniature. In John Adams' words, it would think, feel, reason, and act like the people. Elections are, of course, one principal way of achieving this goal, but there are others. The founders believed it crucial that members of Congress feel the effects of their legislation in precisely the same way the people do. They emphasized that members of Congress would be subject to the laws they enact, just like the people, and so would share a, quote, communion of interests and sympathy of sentiments with the people, as the Federalist Papers put it. The separation of powers preserves that communion, for by borrowing Congress from enhancing its own powers through legislation, it prevents the distorting incentives to which such a possibility would give rise. These arrangements serve to channel the people's views into legislation. But as the founders discovered during the turbulent first years of independence, the people is no monolithic entity. It comprises a vast diversity of interests and opinion groups, some of which are all too willing to use state power to exploit their opponents. The founder solution to this problem relied on these very same diverse interests and opinion groups. To garner a majority of votes, legislation must attract the support of many disparate factions and so must appeal either to interests most or all Americans share or to our common sense of justice. And while it's also possible for legislation to achieve passage based on its appeal to a majority coalition of factions, the multipolar legislative process was intended to make the transaction costs of forging coalitions like this prohibitively high. Now, administrative agencies are not set up to offer the benefits of legislative representation. There are two main models of, of administration, which we can call bureaucratic and presidential. On the bureaucratic side, agencies are supposed to operate rather like policy courts. Indeed, early advocates anal uh, analogized the agencies to courts and argued they should receive the same kinds of protections for their independence that courts enjoy. The problem with the analogy is that statutes often leave substantial policy discretion to the agencies. So agencies, unlike courts, must set policy. But Article III style representation is hopelessly ill-suited to channel the people's policy views. For one thing, agency officials are unelected, nor do they live under the regulations they issue. To the contrary, agencies can enhance their own powers through their regulations, which can sometimes give them interests that are opposite to the people's, notwithstanding the best efforts of the agency staff. Nor can presidential administration supply the qualities of legislative representation. This is mainly because presidential unity exposes the presidential decision-making process to capture by interest in opinion groups which can obtain the executive action they want without persuading representatives of many diverse factions as they must under Article I. Presidential supervision of administrative agencies has much to be said for it, but one thing that cannot be said for it is that it can substitute for Congress's own role. Of currently pending legislation, the Reins Act would go furthest toward reviving legislative representation in the context of the administrative state the act would in large part subject major regulations to the Article I process with its electoral responsiveness, separation of powers, anti-faction protections, and stability-promoting features. 
More broadly, Congress's role with respect to the agencies should be to inject into the process those qualities that legislative representation was intended to provide. Looper Bright and Relentless can help Congress to do so by lowering the transaction costs of enacting uh, um, legislative text that limits agency discretion. Thank you.